Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar on laryngeal transplantation of VCA. This webinar is the fifth session in a multi-webinar series on VCA for the transplant community, the need and the achieved debunking the myths. This webinar series is presented by the AST Vascular Composite Allotransplant Advisory Council. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. Currently on your screen, there's a viewership poll. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the AST website next week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archived recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A section in the Zoom webinar panel at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during the presentation. If you have any questions that we don't have time for, we will answer them individually offline. And finally, at the conclusion of today's webinar, there will be a short survey that there will be a short survey that we ask for you to complete. Please fill this out to keep, help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Eric Gendon, to begin our presentation. Well, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to attend. I want to thank the AST for uh, the sponsorship and for all of the support. This is the first uh, in a series of webinars really designed around vascular rest composite allograft transplantation, in particular head and neck. Um, our guest for today um, is the esteemed professor David Lott. David is um, a professor at the Mayo Clinic uh, College of Medicine and Science. He is the chair of the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. Um, David received his uh, medical degree from the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine and then completed his residency at Cleveland Clinic, where he first became interested in transplantation and particularly laryngeal transplantation. He then uh, received further fellowship training at, uh, in laryngology and professional voice at the Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. Um, David is an associate uh, uh, director of the Mayo Clinic Center for Regenerative Biotherapeutics. Um, he is a distinguished uh, scientist and clinician um, who has been involved in transplantation uh, really for all of his career. Um, his lab is initiating an FDA-approved human clinical trial uh, to evaluate the efficacy of tissue-engineered technologies, and he has the world's first UNOS-approved laryngeal transplant human clinical trial. Um, David has authored many publications on all forms of laryngeal reconstruction and regenerative techniques, um, and really is a leader uh, internationally uh, in this area. Um, he brings to us today an opportunity to explore and better understand laryngeal transplantation. You know, where where has it started? Where is it going? Where are we now? And uh, Dr. Lott, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh, share your expertise with us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Dr. Gannon. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you also to AST for supporting this series. I think this is a really important conversation to have as we look forward to how can we better improve patients' quality of life? How can we expand not only kind of head and neck transplantation, but VCA transplantation uh, in general? So I'm uh, really excited to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, uh, which is laryngeal transplantation. Um, so I'll get going here, if I can get that going. Uh, I don't have anything to uh, disclose. Um, and um, this is the, a general overview of what I plan on speaking today and look forward to some of the discussion afterwards. Um, again, this is really meant to be more of a high level overview of where we are with laryngeal transplantation and then look forward to, to answering questions and, and seeing where uh, interests lie um, afterwards. So uh, first is just looking at, you know, why is laryngeal transplantation even important? And then taking a look back at where the history of laryngeal transplantation is a little bit about our transplantation program uh, currently, uh, what we're doing from a clinical trial standpoint and basic science research standpoint, uh, and then where I see the future of laryngeal transplantation uh, being and how we're trying to, to play an integral role in that. Uh, so the first part of it is, you know, why is laryngeal transplantation important? Um, 
for those of us in the ENT world, we understand this, but it's, it's hard for a lot of people um, to really understand why the larynx is important in general. Um, you know, it's hard even for people to even pronounce larynx correctly sometimes. Um, so, so to really have an idea again of why uh, laryngeal transplantation is important. Um, and you know, this is this is really kind of the, the gist of it here for me is um, when the larynx is not functional, um, it has a huge impact on patients' uh, quality of life, and everything changes from that point on. Nothing, nothing, just like that says, nothing will ever be the same. Um, so, if you think about what happens, is you know the larynx is the regulator for a lot of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. It's kind of how we interact with the world and a lot of our important uh, life-preserving functions. So, from a, a breathing standpoint. Uh, if you have a laryngectomy or people with severe laryngeal dysfunction have to breathe through a, a stoma or a tracheostomy tube, um, you have to permanently breathe through the neck. You never really get in water. Um, even sometimes, you know, taking a bath or ball in the shower or something like that can be, can be dangerous. Um, your nose is no longer connected to your airway. So if you get a cold, um, you can't sniff. And unfortunately, the nose is right over your mouth. So that's, you know, that's a, a, a big problem for people. And because, you're, again, your nose isn't connected, um, you really can't sniff, you can't smell things. And so it, it really has a, a big outcome on taste. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, the stoma itself can be embarrassing for people. Uh, from a swallowing standpoint, um, you know, even if you had a laryngectomy sometimes with severe radiation problems, uh, still can't swallow well. Or people, again, with severe laryngeal dysfunction can't swallow and they require a permanent feeding tube. Um, never really get a chance to sit down and taste food. And if you think about what it is that we do um, with family and friends, you know, you think of holidays and uh, celebrations and everything is around food, around the dinner table or, or getting together to, to eat. Um, and when you can't eat, um, one, not only highlights your disability, um, but you never really get to take place in a lot of the social things that you that people like to do when they're together. Perhaps the biggest thing that patients um, are the most concerned about and have the uh, the biggest quality of life loss is their lost their ability to communicate. Um, you know, again, if sometimes if the severe laryngeal scarring, there's no voice at all, or patients with uh, laryngectomy, um, some have good uh, speaking with a TEP or an electrolarynx, but even at that, um, it's difficult to communicate, um, especially if you think about everything we do, you know, as voice recognition now, um, and it's really difficult for computers to understand uh, TEP uh, voicing. And so it's hard to, to speak on the phone. Um, and because you can't express yourself, you can't tell jokes, you can't, you know, you can't be a part of the conversation. If you're out at a, a restaurant and people can't hear you when they're, when they're speaking. So you get this loss of identity. And when you put those things together, what really happens is people become very socially isolated. Um, you know, I have many patients tell me, yeah, I may, you know, I may be alive, but not, I'm not living. Um, I'm, I'm really isolated. Um, so just kind of the shell of, of, of surviving. Um, and so back a long time ago, actually as early as in the 1960s, the, the question was asked is why can't we just transplant the larynx and get normal function? Um, and so you know, the very first partial laryngeal transplantation was done in 1969 um, and the patient was for a cancer patient. And unfortunately that patient had a recurrence of his cancer and, and succumbed to his, his disease. And so that, that really hurt um, progress of laryngeal transplantation and uh, you know, transplantation for quote unquote quality of life for a long time um, until uh, Dr. Marshall Strom um, had, had tried that again um, further uh, down the road and we'll get to that in a minute. And so if we ask ourselves now, why we know we've had this failure or where, um, why is it so important to do this in the setting of immunosuppression and everything else that can go wrong with a big surgery. Well, if you look at what we look at, you know, we, we see there's a big improvement of quality of life and restoration of smell, taste, swallowing, and human communication in a voice that's uniquely someone's own. It's not robotic. It's not a TEP voice. It's your voice. Um, a lot of times this can prevent laryngectomy. So, you know, many laryngectomies are done for functional reasons. And so if we have a way to uh, restore laryngeal function, um, patients never have to undergo a true laryngectomy. Um, and this really does save life, this lives. Again, we think about these as quality of life types of transplants, but um, they really do save lives. 
Um, you know, I, I just, just went through this with a patient who was in his fifties who had to have a laryngectomy and he decided to die from his cancer instead of living this way. And you go through a list of, of idea of what people are going to be like. And he just said, I don't want to live like that. So he decided he, and he ultimately passed away from his cancer. Um, and some cancers are unresectable um, because they have extensive tissue involvement. So if we have a way to actually reconstruct these cancers um, and in the setting of cancer, uh, we may actually be able to save uh, more lives um, from a cancer standpoint because we can transplant more of these tissues. Uh, the patient desire is there. Um, there's a study done uh, many years ago that showed 75% of laryngectomy patients would accept a larynx transplant if offered. Um, and in Dr. Strom's uh, first uh, uh, transplant, uh, the New England Journal, when he submitted it, um, a transplant surgeon and a laryngectomy was one of the reviewers. And in that review said, if I was 40 years old, I would probably consider undergoing the operation myself. So again, the desire is there, the ability is there, um, um, and the improvement uh, for people's lives are, are there. Um, so in response to that, uh, one of the things that we uh, created at Mayo Clinic um, is what we call the laryngotracheal or kind of regeneration program, right? So it's taking a look at, it's actually the head and neck re reconstructive regeneration program, but this is looking specifically at the larynx and trachea portion of it. And there are really two primary parts. Uh, what we're speaking mostly of today is the larynx transplant program, and that includes both a human clinical trial and ways to, to improve immunosuppression uh, so that many of the drawbacks with transplantation um, are, um, uh, are, are surpassed. Uh, the other part of it is tissue engineered implantation, where we use tissue engineering to do partial laryngeal implants, tracheal implants, and, and vocal fold implants. But we're mostly going to talk about the, the transplant today. Um, and one thing to, to kind of get it straight is when we talk about laryngeal transplantation, it's really more than the larynx itself. It's truly, it's a, really a composite transplant. So it's the larynx, uh, the trachea, and you know, all the way down to the kind of the proximal third of the trachea, uh, the pharyngeal structures, the proximal third of the esophagus, thyroid and parathyroids, the vessels and nerves that go along with it, um, and can even bring skin. Um, so you can really do almost a neck transplant to, to, to some extent in terms of what you can get um, with these various uh, uh, surgeries. All right, so now looking at the history of laryngeal transplantation, I mentioned the very first one back in, in 1969, um, but then uh, Dr. Strom back in 1998 had, had been doing uh, surgeries um, and this, and he, uh, I believe may even be listening uh, today, um, um, but is, was really at the forefront of being able to actually get uh, total laryngeal transplantation um, into uh, the mainstream. And he's the reason why I have um, uh, been interested in this and I, and I see the value in this. I know um, I've seen firsthand what a benefit it can have for people and life changing it can be. Uh, so he did the first uh, uh, complete human laryngeal transplantation uh, back in 1998. This was in a, a patient, a 40-year-old male who had a traumatic uh, laryngeal injury about 20 years prior. Um, and after the transplant, he was voicing at three days, had purposeful swallowing at three months. At 36 months, he had essentially normal phonation, and he actually went on to become a motivational speaker. Um, so amazing results uh, for, for the very first uh, transplant. And here's a, a video I was able to get of he and uh, the patient and Dr. Strom kind of reviewing uh, the process and, and what a huge impact it had on his life. So here's Dr. Strom and the patient. I don't feel down anymore. I mean, it's one of the greatest things that has ever happened to me. Although Tim endured 20 years with a robotic voice. I'm a fighter. That's what I am. Today, Tim speaks and can even sing with a voice he can call his own. And the land of the free and the home of the brave. So to me, pretty amazing. That, that gives me chills to know that you can restore someone's voice to that level of function to the point where they can even sing um, and sadly even sing better than I do. Um, you did notice that he, he still has the stoma there. Um, you know, I think that's uh, from a couple of different uh, reasons. One is you know, the first ever, nobody really knows if there is a um, episode of rejection or an emergency, uh, you won't have a safe airway uh, for the patient. Um, there are ways to, to, to counteract that. 
um, with, with advances in the way the nerves are sutured back together um, and other structural uh, surgeries you can do to the larynx to try to restore either some of that vocal fold motion or to put the vocal folds in a more favorable position to be able to get the, the patient to have that stoma closed. Uh, the second uh, transplant was performed in 2012 um, at uh, UC Davis. Um, this was in a 51-year-old uh, woman um, who uh, was actually a, a great candidate also. So she had a uh, was already on immunosuppressive therapy for another transplant um, that she had had. Was highly mo um, highly motivated, and you see very similar results. So she was voicing at 13 days eating a normal diet at 11 months and at a year and a half, it had essentially near, near normal uh, phonation. And uh, my understanding is doing well still to this date. You can see she has a, a tracheostomy in, uh, in addition. Uh, the third one reported that uh, was done back in 2015 in a 34 year old man. And this was a, a very complex one. This was done in Poland. Um, this was a patient who had had a previous radiation um, and a laryngectomy for laryngeal cancer six years before. Um, and ended up having a fistula and a lot of, a lot of complications from the, uh, the radiation and the surgeries. Um, so he um, also very similar results, voicing at two weeks, normally eating and drinking. Um, they also uh, transplanted some of the skin. You can see in the picture that there's a, a, a skin flap that's uh, covering his neck. Um, and this patient is uh, tracheostomy free. Um, I've also spoken with uh, the Poland team and, and per the report, the patient's uh, doing well. Um, there's also been a, a large series of patients uh, transplanted uh, by uh, Dr. Tintinago in Colombia, um, who hasn't uh, reported many of his, or really reported uh, any of those uh, transplants in the um, uh, literature. Um, and in speaking with him and listening to some of the presentations, you know, it has had mixed results. His, his patients were very uh, complicated, um, um, but again, good results and some, some mixed there. So what that boils down to is us trying to have to figure out, okay, well, we know that this, is, this can be successful. We know that there is an opportunity for this, um, and we need to put together a, a program. And so, you know, that was one of the, the to me, the, the biggest uh, problems with transplantation is that you've had wonderful successes um, and great programs, but there hasn't been a consistent place for patients to be able to come and know this is being studied, and to have a, a true program that's set up. So we um, uh, reached out and, and began a not only program, but a clinical trial that we got approved through um, uh, UNOS. Um, to, so we started should partner, I should say, with, with UNOS. Um, and those program goals are essentially to, to fulfill that unmet need, right? So again, we know capabilities there, we know the outcomes are, are good, and at least the few that have been reported. Um, but there hasn't been a consistent place. So we wanted to establish a trusted and consistent place for uh, these patients to be treated. Um, we wanted to study the safety and efficacy of laryngeal transplantation. You know, an N of three uh, that have been published isn't a, a very large number. So we really want to understand what does this look like? Um, and we want to get it to the point where if it really is successful the way we think it is and have the, has the benefits that we think it is, that insurances will recognize laryngeal transplantation as a covered procedure. And ultimately, we want to be able to expand the indications um, to be able to encompass more patients that would, would uh, truly benefit from laryngeal transplantation. So as you can imagine, um, uh, creating a, a program like this is a big undertaking. Um, and we could not have done this without the uh, collaboration of multiple, multiple partners in various uh, uh, disciplines. And so, you know, it's, it's really a partnership between our ENT department and our, our transplantation program at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we have a wonderful transplantation uh, program with, with wonderful people who have really helped push this through. You know, being an ENT, I had no idea the amount of work and regulatory components and everything that went behind a transplant program. So you know, we couldn't have done any of this without, without that partnership. Um, and we have to have the research support in place, um, partnerships with the organ procurement um, organizations, um, and again, have that patient desire that's there. So um, it's been it's been a wonderful uh, opportunity to get to meet and work with a lot of people kind of outside of our my normal ENT sphere. Um, we've put together uh, an executive team uh, that's also multidisciplinary uh, to come together 
um, and and really push this forward. So I'm the uh, surgical director, uh, my partner, Dr. Girish Moore, the medical director, and uh, Elizabeth Stearns is our uh, operations administrator. And then I could go through every single person in that list who's uh, made a wonderful uh, contribution um, and deserves that, but I just will we'll run out of time. So um, a big thank you to, the, to this team. Uh, the other part that we thought was really important um, because we have so much time um, and effort kind of built into this is we want to make sure that our emotions um, and desires for a success for this program are removed as much as we can from this. And so um, we've reached out to, to create a data advisory committee um, who provides oversight and monitoring of the study to make sure that the safety of the participants and validity and integrity of the data are always kind of the foremost um, uh, desire for what we are wanting to do. And that includes everything from bioethicists um, to research uh, uh, coordinators um, and even patient representatives who have undergone um, surgeries on their larynx and have uh, laryngeal dysfunction and understand what a big impact this can have on people's lives so that we're making decisions based off of what's best for the patient and not necessarily what's best for our program. Um, and then in addition to that, um, as you can imagine, it, it takes a lot of background prep work um, to, to kind of create this. You know, it's um, because this sort of transplantation, I'm sure Dr. Gendon had to do a lot of the same thing. Um, when you say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the laryngeal transplantation and we're going to have this patient in the hospital for a certain amount of time. Um, everybody in the hospital says, what? What are you talking about? How do we take care of this patient? What do we need to do? Um, and so we've had lots of uh, uh, great discussions and education um, in the op with the operating room team, the ICU, um, some of our intermediate care areas, and everybody that we essentially can think of so that there aren't any surprises, so that everybody's part of that discussion um, and understands what it is that these patients are, what their needs are, um, and how it's similar, and um, basically compare and contrast to what they're, the patients that they're, they're used to. Um, and then I'm not going to go through all these, but, you know, again, further, further collaborations with everybody from pharmacy to nursing to some of our, our research programs um, uh, and just and making sure that everybody, again, is on the same page when, when these patients come. Um, and then lastly, we've had to go through and do update our policies and procedures and make sure they're always up to date and constantly revisit those, uh, create patient handouts um, and everything we basically can think of. Um, uh, to make sure the patient is also well taken care of and is as informed as they possibly can be for something that's relatively new. All right, so that brings us to our, our clinical trial and what we're trying to do with uh, the clinical trial itself. Um, so we have uh, been approved internally through Mayo to do a total of 10 transplants. Um, as many as two transplants per year for five years. If it's one transplant for 10 years, that's great. Um, but we don't want to overload the system. Again, it's, we understand that it's um, new and um, there's a lot that goes on with, with bringing these patients into the hospital system. So we do the first transplant and then essentially review each surgery for the safety, efficacy, cost, really trying our best to understand everything that's involved with laryngeal transplantation. Um, so that we understand if other places want to do similar. Again, the goal isn't for, for us or Mayo Clinic to be the only people that do transplantation. We want to make this available for patients all over. And so that's really the purpose of this clinical trial. Um, so we are, we are currently recruiting for uh, uh, patients for this, um, and I'll go over the indications here in a minute. Um, so what we're looking for specifically with these early transplants are you know, patients that have a functional laryngectomy indication. So these are people that are, tend to be tracheostomy dependent. They are feeding tube dependent, um, may have a difficult time talking. So one of those main primary laryngeal functions, if not two or three of all of them, um, have to be severely uh, uh, damaged for them. And can't be fixed by some other standard of care procedure. So patients that we say, hey, you know, you would be actually better off uh, without your larynx. So if you're at that point, um, then, you know, that's where we see you as a candidate for the transplantation program. Um, part of that is because if we do the larynx transplant and it happens to fail, 
um, those patients would be converted to a laryngectomy. And so it helps um, me ethically and I think helps everybody else around them ethically and the, the patients themselves understand that, you know, yes, you gave it a shot, you had a laryngeal transplantation and other than, you know, going through that whole process, you ultimately ended off where you were going to be anyway with the laryngectomy. Um, um, so we hope that doesn't happen for these patients, but if it, it does happen, um, then again, that would be their ultimate outcome anyway. So functional laryngectomy indications, which includes things like radiation and fibrosis, uh, maybe, you know, uh, cancer and a, a patient that's already on immunosuppression um, is some sort of low grade um, or benign tumor that's locally destructive. Um, and their, laryngeal, their larynx isn't functioning because of that. What we hope to see in the not too distant future is the ability to um, transplant in the setting of cancer. Um, you know, again, there's a, a big need for this to prevent people from even needing a laryngectomy uh, to, to begin with. And I'll discuss a little bit of what we're, we're doing to, to work toward that end. Um, but really ultimate goal is to even provide transplantation as an option for people that have already had laryngectomy. Um, the reason why we're not starting off with this patient group is, you know, um, as you can imagine, uh, once a laryngectomy has been performed, you, you, the reliability of the nerves and the vessels is a little uncertain. So we don't know if we can find the nerves. We don't know if we can find the proper vessels or, um, you know, if those vessels will, will work and, you know, what the status is going to be. It adds a whole new layer of variability within that. Um, the pro to that is, you know, these patients really would receive the most benefit and I think would perceive the greatest benefit. Um, you know, I think we've, uh, a lot of the head and neck cancer surgeons, you know, patients who have a functional laryngectomy because they haven't been able to eat for, you know, 10, 15 years or, um, you know, haven't been able to talk are tend to be really happy after they get their laryngectomy um, because they know what life is like um, when they're struggling. Uh, patients that we do laryngectomies for cancers and haven't had to go through that, you know, it's much harder for them to, to adjust to the laryngectomy. And I would see the same thing happening with uh, laryngeal transplantation patients is, you know, um, if you understood again, what a big quality of life hit it is to not have your larynx, I think a lot of people would really um, perceive the benefit um, there. Plus there are a lot of patients out there um, living with laryngectomies, not only in the US, but, but worldwide. Um, and these are our study endpoints. Um, you know, essentially, we're uh, looking at one year graft tolerance. We understand that's a very short time frame in the in the scale of transplantation, and we're not going to uh, we're not going to stop following the patients at one year. Um, but just in terms of a clinical trial, you know, what does what does the graft look like at that one year uh, time point? And then we're looking at laryngeal function secondary to that. Are they swallowing without aspiration? And what is their uh, voice function? What is their pulmonary function? And were we able to get the tracheostomy tube be cannulated? And then kind of our tertiary things are, you know, what is their perception essentially? And what are some of the day-to-day the -day, uh, life types of things that go into transplantation, like quality of life scores, length of hospital stays, what were the short and long-term complications, readmission rates, those kinds of things. Understanding again, the entire process of, of laryngeal transplantation. Um, we understand that this is a, a big undertaking and um, having another clinical trial where you do 10, 10 transplants as a part of clinical trial probably may not happen again or may not happen at least for a while. So we're trying to get as much into this trial as we possibly can. Um, so we awarded this um, a grant called an OBAID grant, this internal in, in Mayo Clinic Care, um, where we look at essentially the quality of life components of this. What, what are people's expectations for transplantation? Um, so again, what, what are the, of not only the laryngeal transplant candidates, but their caregivers and their clinicians. You know, kind of what is, what is their perception of experience? What are they anticipating getting from it? And so they have separate qualitative interviews um, uh, through our, our ethics uh, department um, that we're not a part of, both with the patients and the caregivers and the, the same uh, ethics group, um, uh, interviews the uh, clinicians. And we look at it, you know, when they first come for an evaluation, um, when they get their uh, decision on, hey, yes, we'd like to move forward, or we're going to, we're going to put you on hold for a while, or you're not an acceptable transplant, you know, what were your expectations after um, at that point, what were your expectations after you finally met with us? And then once you've had the transplant, 
did the, did the transplantation actually meet those expectations or what did you learn? What should we tell people differently? Um, the second aim is to understand what the, the, the true views of current patients with a laryngectomy, um, what their views are about laryngeal transplantation. So we sent out questionnaires um, uh, to get their input. And so these are some of the results we've got. I think uh, to me, they're very interesting. Um, so the AIM one, where we've looked at the, the expectations from transplantation, some of these, these are all now pre, obviously pre-transplantation uh, interviews. Um, and these are just some of the things that we've heard from patients, you know, that a laryngectomy would be a horrible option. So these are coming from the candidates themselves. Um, um, that the uh, patient spoke about losing the ability to eat and speak. Um, and how that's affected him socially, kind of going back to that social isolation. Um, again, social isolation, again, this is not my words, but the, the patients, um, and how that's caused him great emotional pain. Um, again, leaving social, you have the patient leaving social situations because he was choking on food and frustrated that he couldn't speak. Um, and looking at the benefits, um, what he thought maybe some of the benefits would be, would be gaining a degree of normalcy and he believes that the risks are well worth taking and that his life really couldn't get much more worse than it is uh, today. Now, if you look at the caregivers, um, you see a similar, similar um, type of, of, of statements here. So agreeing with the patient's description um, and adding that they, she wants him to be able to live that life, life he can and that he deserves. Um, feeling positive about their ability to tolerate a long recovery and that the final outcome would be, would be good. Um, and experiences as a caregiver about how she feels helpless um, during kind of the, some of these episodes and his basically current quality of life types of things. So these are examples from, from one patient. We've had multiple patients kind of go through this, but you know, I think these are pretty representative of what most of the, the patients and caregivers have, uh, have said. Um, if we look at uh, AIM-2, um, we've got a, a response from about 50 patients, sorry, from about 25 patients. We set out about 56 um, uh, questionnaires and got 25 in the back, which is above average, which to me again says something about how important of a topic this is to, uh, to these patients. Um, and if you look at some of the questions we asked, so what's the biggest benefit from transplantation? So uh, the vast majority of them, not surprisingly me, said uh, voice, getting their voice improved, um, breathing improved, following by the swallowing and the cosmetics components to it. Um, when asked about how many of you would have a transplant if it was safe, um, about 92% of patients uh, said they would want to have a, a transplant. When you get into the weeds, it changes a little bit. So would I have a transplant if it meant needing uh, medical follow-up for many years? And still about 75% of patients said they would do that. Um, if it meant they had to stay in the hospital for about a month, and that really didn't decrease uh, too much with that. Um, how about if there was no guarantee to restore the normal voice and two thirds of patients still said they would do it. Um, what's interesting is it got worse if you said you was no guarantee you'd have a normal swallow. So even though voice was the primary concern and the biggest perceived benefit, uh, patients didn't want to lose their ability to swallow. Um, and then same thing, understanding that needing to be on immunosuppression for life, um, asking that kind of specific uh, question, um, cut it down to about half. Half still said they would be interested. Half said they would not be interested in the immunosuppression side of things. So again, to me, that says a lot that we need to find better ways of being able to do these transplants without the potential problems that immunosuppression um, has along with this. Um, and then we did kind of this uh, word cloud where you um, take um, the written parts of the questionnaires and we take the, the quality of life measurements and we pick out the most common words that we see from that. And you see things like hope, restore a voice, interact with people again, communication, improve quality of life. But to me, this one really kind of says the most is to be able to become visible. And again, that goes back to that social, social isolation where you're alive, but not really living. And again, that to me speaks that, you know, even though you have the you know, ability for larynx and trachea transplantation like Dr. Ginnan has done, 
um, these abilities to, to restore these functions for people, you know, they may not always be life-saving, but I feel very strongly that they are life-giving. They give people's lives back. Um, and sometimes that's more important to, to people than actually just being alive. And so, um, again, I think the need is definitely there. Um, looking at what we're doing, some of the things from a basic research standpoint, and a lot of this dates back um, many years, even back to, to when I was working with uh, Dr. Stroman in, in his lab. Um, but really, the question is, is one, one, can we reduce the immunosuppression? And two, can we transplant in the setting of cancer as a way that we can, we can actually do that? Um, so we've created a, both a mouse and a rat transplantation model. Again, this was, I say we, um, this was when I was working with Dr. Strom. This is all his, his uh, uh, work um, to, in these mouse models and, and rat models. Um, being able to, to test these VCA kinds of transplants, especially the larynx, um, in a model where they're perfused. And you can actually now look at the rejection. So we can, we can scale, if you did a transplantation, and you didn't get any immunosuppression, you can see what the, the projected changes are over time. And it really takes about a week for the larynx to be completely uh, rejected um, in, in, a, in a mouse. Um, so we can get a lot of information from that. Um, it's a great way to keep up your microsurgical skills and it's a great, great way for residents and, and med students to learn microsurgical skills because mouse uh, carotid arteries are really, really small. Um, and one of the things that we looked at is uh, Everlimus um, because it has a lot of the, the characteristics that we're looking for. So one is it, you know, it's real sparing, but it has the immunosuppressive properties, but it's also anti-proliferative. So we wanted to look at that in the setting of, of laryngeal uh, transplantation and, and, and specifically in um, setting of cancer. Um, most cancers in the head and neck are squamous cell carcinoma, so we chose that. And here we, um, you can see the, the difference between a mouse that's injected with squamous cell carcinoma uh, just under the skin, so subcutaneously, and given um, nothing or given Everolimus for 21 days. And here you can see, here's the, the tumor growth um, with the left untreated, and here it is at, at 21 days. So significant um, prevention in progression of the squamous cell cancer. If you look at in distant disease, and we look at it, um, inject the, the cancer cells through the, the tail vein, and we um, look at the lung um, metastases, um, you can see a very similar finding. So, you know, this we had to stop at 14 days because the, uh, the mice would ultimately succ succumb to, to their uh, lung cancers at that time frame. And all this, this is one picture. This is very representative. You know, the vast majority of these lungs um, either had no tumor or, you know, maybe one small spot that was, that was on the lungs um, at 14 days. Um, so we know that Everlimus does have a significant anti-proliferative effect on these squamous cell cancers, which is perfect for our head and neck uh, patient population. The other thing we wanted to look at as well is there may be a way to get the same benefit of immunosuppression um, by reducing the total amount of you know, immunosuppression that the patients are getting. Can you get the same functional and prevention of rejection outcomes, tolerance outcomes, um, by changing the way you, you dose the um, immunosuppressive? So again, we looked at the same thing. We looked at, we decided to pulse Everlimus and uh, uh, anti-alpha beta uh, TCR. Um, and so what we did is we looked at a total of 15 days of immunosuppression we gave um, a dose on, uh, sorry, seven, seven days dose beginning day one, and then a five day dose beginning day 90, and then a three, do three day dose at 180. That's a tongue twister for me, sorry about that. Um, so again, a total of 15 days worth of immunosuppression. And what we found is that um, with just 15 days worth of immunosuppression, um, at 10 months, we had essentially normal allograft survival. We just ended the, the study at 10 months. And here's what the histology looks like. So here you can see this is this is actually down in the, the proximal tracheal portion of this. But you can see everything from uh, the ciliated epithelium here. You can see cells within the cartilage. You can see part of the thyroid gland here. Um, and this is essentially a, you know, a normal histological um, uh, proximal trachea. And for those of you that are still paying attention, you can see Waldo down there in the bottom. That's just to make sure you guys are, are still awake. Uh, here is Waldo to highlight 
that you still even see fat. And again, on that rejection grading scale, um, the first thing that you see go at day one is the fat. Fat, for whatever reason, is, is the first thing that we see um, com completely destroyed, even at one day with no immunosuppression. And here you can see at 10 months, you essentially have a normal accumulation of, of, of fat um, within the, the trachea there. So uh, to me, again, that says quite a bit that one is you can reduce the amount of immunosuppression and still have great um, tolerance. Um, the other part of that is that, you know, you can use a medication that has great anti-proliferative effect for the primary cancer that affects our head and neck our, um, patients. So um, we're really primed to be able to do this uh, nicely in, in our head and neck cancer population. Um, the other way is to say, well, what if we don't use immunosuppression at all? What if we teach the, the body to recognize um, the, uh, the, the donor larynx as a self? And so we looked at uh, dendritic cells uh, because again, they're the um, kind of most potent ant antigen presenting cell. And I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but you know, the way that dendritic cells um, cause rejection is by maturing. They present the, uh, the protein and they mature uh, to a kind of a, di a different cell type and present that. And that's how the body knows that, hey, you know, simplistically, that's how the body knows that, hey, this is a foreign antigen we need to go uh, prevent. Uh, uh, reject this or destroy this. <clears throat> so we're able to fortify those dendritic cells using uh, NF kappa B. Um, and this we just did as a one-time uh, dose. So we gave, we gave a dose essentially at the time of transplantation. So we took the, the dendritic cells, fortified them so they couldn't mature, and then gave them a dose um, at the time of transplantation, um, and then looked at how things were 60 days uh, later, and essentially saw that um, Again, there was only mild evidence. Some of the fat and some of the cilia were gone in, in, in the histology. So mild evidence of rejection. Um, but if you looked at the uh, systemic immune system, um, it was completely in intact. And so we were able to get donor specific tolerance. Um, again, this was just a, a, a kind of a trial um, study to see, is this even something that's feasible? So um, showing promise there too, that we can maybe teach the, um, the body uh, to, accept these uh, transplanted organs as, as self. <clears throat> um, and then uh, just kind of wrapping the last few things up here before we go into uh, some of the questions is just the future of laryngeal transplantation, kind of the way I see it anyway. Um, and you know, to me, um, you know, the biggest need is to either obviate or, complete, or reduce the need for immunosuppression. And that's either through immunomodulation like we just discussed, or through some sort of tissue engineering or a combination of the two, using those two things. And so we actually have a, a master's student who's starting her, her year with us, who's gonna be looking at um, trying to do combinations of some of these things where you maybe reduce some of the antigenic part of it, of the, of the, the larynx, and, and then teach the immune system to recognize that. So a lot of different combinations that we're, we're trying to look at. Um, but we've come a long way already. I'm gonna go through this quickly because I've talked a lot longer than I, than I thought I would at this point. Um, but we have some of these capabilities now to be able to do this. And so again, it's a whole team of people that come together to actually make these things work. Um, and this is looking at the basic science of things. Um, and essentially what we can do is we can do um, a GMP grade tissue engineering and we can actually manufacture some of these things and then implant those in, into patients. So we're, we're developing these capabilities and I already have these uh, up in the, in the clean room. Um, so that allows us to do everything from 3D bio bioprinting to electrospinning to tissue decellarization and then, and then kind of do run the whole gamut of, of how we can get this into, into patients. Um, and I'm going to skip fast forward through this. Essentially what we're doing though is we can take the, the structure of the larynx. So right now we can only do part of it. But if we can adapt some of this, the, these capabilities, um, we can either, um, you know, what people have looked at when we decelerize laryngeus in the past is it loses some of the structure, it loses some of the strength. You get great um, tissue integration in a lot of ways, but you're losing the, the structural integrity of that. So maybe we can combine some of the tissue engineering capabilities um, with the, the natural um, matrix um, within the larynx to, to be able to um, circumvent some of those problems. So we can use that, we can integrate, we can get a model of the cancers that we're removing, we can design the scaffold for it, and then either directly 3D print um, uh, the, the shape or 3D print a mold that we then shape with the, uh, another scaffold too. 
I'll go through these quickly again. Then we can secondary either add to that or we could um, uh, again the directly electrospin onto a larynx or something like that to, again to, to to bolster the response. And um, we can even you know when you decelerize things, the the vocal fold itself loses some of its, its structure and and its uh, integrity, so it doesn't vibrate correctly. And so we've been able to actually um, recreate a new uh, kind of trilayered vocal fold structure that I'm going to go through as quickly again, that is tunable. So we can, based off the stiffness, we can tune it to try to match the, the fundamental frequency that the patient had otherwise. So for one for women, one for men, or try to kind of match the frequency of how, how fast the vocal fold actually vibrates. Um, this is the... the the vibratory portion that just shows, hey, that it looks that vibrates like a vocal fold should vibrate. Um, this is what it sounds like. It's just a nice buzz. Not terribly exciting, but that's what that's what vocal folds sound like. If you remove them from the body, they just sound like a buzz. Here's kind of that sound um, with a um, a jet. So you hear kind of a, a jet phonation here, and you'll hear the same kind of buzz. So that's the true vocal fold sound. But again. Um, you can get these to, to vibrate at the proper frequency. So this one I just played for you was at 140 hertz, which is right in the middle of the male range. You can get pure tones that come off of them. So it's not just sound. It's actually, a, a, it's not just noise. It's actually a sound. Um, and then we've actually been able to translate some of these into practice. And so, you know, here are some of these implants here where this was about a four centimeter segment of the trachea and some of that's already on immune suppression. I tried for over a year to try to get her airway opened up. This was the left side. It was about a two millimeter opening. The right side is three months afterwards with the implant. And there she is at six months, kind of completely epithelialized and, and opened up. Um, she's now about two years out um, and still doing just fine. Here's our one of our hemilarynx implants. This lady had a chondrosarcoma and we did a, a left hemilaryngectomy. So this left side is the tissue engineered side. And you can see that um, you really can't tell the difference between the, with the implanted side and the other side. Um, you even see some motion of the false vocal folds um, during phonation, which is amazing to me because it's not part of our scaffold. So um, you see that the body is its really own best bioreactor. So we can take a, a donor larynx and have it in the right circumstances so it's set up for success. You'll see that the body will come in and re it and start to grow some of this function back with time. So that's, this picture is about uh, two years out, I believe. Here's the patient's uh, voice afterwards. Here's what a laryngectomy patient sounds like, what she would have sounded like. The rainbow is a division of light and light into many beautiful colors. They're, they make their, their esophagus vibrate. So essentially it's kind of like verb talking. Here's where she was. She saw her trach tube in at this point at three months. When sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. Um, and here she is at three years. Unfortunately, she started smoking again, so her voice deteriorated a little bit. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. At that point, she had had her, her trach tube out, eating and drinking just fine. So again, I, I show that because that helps us know that the capability is there. We can combine some of these things. You know, I can only do half a larynx or even, you know, less than half a larynx with this type of thing. So many people need an entire larynx, so we, this may be a way that... Uh, to circumvent some of those, those blocks. And so just wanted to leave you real quick with the summary. Again, laryngeal transplantation can save lives and restore quality of life for patients. There's a strong patient interest in there, but we need more clinical kind of in-depth clinical research to better determine what the clinical utilization can and should look like. We need to have more in-depth basic science research to expand the indications and improve safety. Um, come up with innovative options you know, with either combinations of immunomodulation or regenerative medicine that can kind of cause a, a paradigm shift in the way we look at uh, approaches to graft tolerances. Um, and as you all know, VCA is, is growing and laryngeal transplantation research not only can help aid laryngeal transplantation, but really can contribute to the overall field of, of VCA. Um, and then lastly, just to kind of drive home the, the point of the need from this, I get lots of um, letters and, and emails from people when they when they read about the research and and it's kind of states their what they're going through and I just thought this was a particularly um, nice um, way to to kind of sum up what it is these patients are going through you know this laryngectomy has changed and in too many ways eroded so many of the things I have fought for and treasured I would like to believe that the future holds promise once again 
your dedication and work has given me a profound hope. So again, the fact that we're all here having this discussion that AST is, is allowing this um, sort of a, a group of talks come together, the fact that Dr. Gannon is, is kind of helping lead uh, this discussion, I think goes a long way, not only in advancing the science, but giving patients hope again. So thank you all very much. Please feel free to reach out to me. You know, this is a collaborative um, work. If we really want to get this going, um, the more we can collaborate, the better. So thank you all very much. That was terrific, David. Really um, very thoughtful uh, from beginning to end. And, and you know, we all kind of stand on the shoulders of the, the, the people um, that have mentored us. And, and Marshall Strom has certainly been a, an important part of your and very much a part of my scientific and, and clinical career. Um, we, if you have questions, please go ahead and enter them. I'm going to start out. I have two questions that I think are are actually important. One is something you hear all the time and certainly was one of the reasons why I backed off of laryngeal transplant and kind of spent a good deal of my career focused on trachea. What is the status of neural regeneration as per the issues related to synkinesis? Can we have we made improvements on reinnervation of the vocal folds? And and for those of you, most people uh, on this may or may not be aware that you know one of the issues has always been difficulty in getting the vocal folds to move uh, volitionally to allow for decannulation. And and so where where are you on that in your research? Yeah, so I, yeah, that's a great question because that is still the biggest problem to me that kind of plagues the functional aspect of it and really limits the ability to, to get the trach tube out. And that's one of the things I counsel patients on is, you know, I, I, can, I can pretty strongly tell you you get your swallowing back. I can pretty strongly tell you you're going to have a, a better voice than you have now. Trach tube, I have no idea mm -hmm. um, if we're going to get that out or not. And we're going to work towards it. You know, I, there, there's been a decent amount of research, uh, mostly led by Dr. Marie um, in France, um, looking at different ways to, to hook the vessels up to try to try to get abduction and adduction of the vocal folds. So again, those of you who don't, aren't very familiar with the larynx, in order to breathe, the vocal folds have to be abducted. And then to pr protect your airway and to speak, they have to close. And right now, when we hook those vessels up, we don't really get grave movement, mo motion. You get kind of the syn synchronetic um, uh, reinnervation, like you mentioned. So it doesn't really move very well. And so to try to hook the vessel, the, the nerves up, sorry, so that they open and close, you know, I think the, um, the re some of those results are outstanding and some don't work quite as well. And I don't know if that people n have, uh, really understand the variation on why it works and why it doesn't work sometimes. Um, but we are going to use some of those principles in, in our transplants. And That's then the great. other is yeah. with the PC technology, but yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a question that came in, but selfishly, I want to ask one more question. And, then, and the reason I'm going to ask this question is because as we you know really move from research into trying to help patients, tell me the paying for the financial, you're putting on somebody on immunosuppression for lifelong immunosuppression. Tell me the payment structure, who's paying for this? Um, and how do you, how do you get there? Because I think that's a real significant question uh, for those who are thinking about starting programs. Yeah, no, that's another great question. Um, so we reached out to um, Medicare early on um, and some of our local people here in, in Arizona. And um, made an agreement and said, hey, you know, these, these patients are patients that are going to have a laryngectomy because it's indicated for them and some sort of reconstruction. And so essentially what a laryngeal transplant is, is a laryngectomy and a free flap, if you think about it, because you're, you're putting tissue in and you're hooking up the vessels and that's, that's pretty much what you're doing. Um, and so they were willing to, um, at least in this circumstance, cover the surgery itself as standard of care, a laryngectomy with reconstruction. Um, the immunosuppression isn't covered at this point. And so that's something that's either covered by us uh, clinically through research. If we get this through a, um, a clinical trial structure um, that's recognized by you know, the FDA or the VA or somebody, then perhaps the immunosuppression can even be covered from that degree, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, that's a, I think that's a great answer to a real a very real question that people all over the, not just the country, but, you know, in the world have. Um, one of the questions that came up was, what challenges do you have from the OPO regarding donor eligibility and education? 
Yeah, another great question. Uh, there, there was a lot of education with the OPO group because, again, this is really out of the um, out of the box for pun intended, I guess. Um, from from their standpoint, it, um, it it requires its own separate um, consent um, and understanding that this is the their larynx. There may be some deformity in the case of a, a viewing because of this, um, and then reassurance that the the recipient will not have their loved one's voice. And that's probably the biggest misunderstanding with this is that um, someone won't be walking around with their loved one's voice. The a person's characteristic voice comes from their pharynx, their head, the vocal folds are, are just vibrating, creating that buzzing sound I played earlier. And so they won't be identifiable in somebody else's body. And so that's really the biggest theory. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting you know concept, and I'm sure you know for the layperson uh, and families that that's a big concern. Um, that's a big concern. Are there are there other questions? Um, go ahead and post them if you have other questions, because I don't want to depart until I've made sure everybody's had a chance to 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 ask. Um, I think that um, we'll see if one comes in in the next minute or so. I think that um, what you're doing and what you've done, along with you know where Marshall was and, and Greg Farwell and and all of us have tried to contribute, you know, there's going to be a time here where donor specific immunosuppression uh, changes the game, and I think being prepared technically to manage all of the issues related to the surgical and functional pieces of this are really critical because, you know, the research that you, you know, you see on donor specific immunosuppression is really coming a long way. And uh, so I really applaud um, the, the science that you put behind this. This was not just, uh, Hey, I can plug this in. You're really looking carefully at the science. Do you think that the larynx you know, you, you've got the hand, which has bone, skin, you know, a true composite allograft. The larynx, very similarly, although it doesn't have the bone, it's got the cartilage. Um, does it pose any different or significant or unique challenges to immunosuppression that you've that you've come upon? Um, yeah, it's another great question. Um, not specifically, um, you know, but it is, you know, it has, um, and again, if we include the hyoid, it does have the bone component to it. Yeah. From there, so it have the, you know, the, potentially the bone, the, the cartilage, the epithelium, the thyroid glands, the parathyroid. And so those types of things, I think, are um, a little extraordinary, I think, when we're looking at immunosuppression and what those are um, uh, show. It's also a nice way to be able to, to look for evidence of rejection. You can watch the the thyroid hormone levels, the parathyroid hormone levels, and determine, hey, are things starting to drop off again? And what's the proportion of the donor versus recipient? Yeah. Um, and then I think the other, other intriguing thing about what you've done with the trachea and what we're trying to do in the larynx um, is the fact that it's exposed to the environment. So it's dirty. Yep. And how do you put somebody on immunosuppression, but it's always in a constant dirty environment. So that's the other challenge we've had to work out about. Well, I think I think that's a double-edged sword because we've looked at inhalational uh, immunosuppression, right? Because at least in the trachea, we don't have the complexity that you have in the larynx. And so the epithelium is the target for donor uh, rejection. And so it's interesting, A, because we see re-epithelialization occur where the recipient re-epithelialize the donor graft, um, which creates a, a chimera, an immunologic chimera. Um, and then the other piece here is that because you have exposure to that immunogenic component, the epithelium, inhalational uh, immunosuppression is an interesting concept. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, it goes right to the target tissue. Yeah. Is- yeah. So I don't see any other questions and we're just at three o'clock. I uh, personally want to thank you. You know, this is a, a big ask in time and, and the work you've done is, is incredible. And I, I'm really glad that uh, people around the country have had an opportunity to see what you're doing, where you're going and how this is progressing. So uh, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. And thank you again for spearheading this. You bet. Have a great day. Thank you all for watching. Bye. NAST would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's session. All webinars from this series can be found on the AST website, and the recording for today's session will be posted next week. And please remember to complete the evaluation survey. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.